is something that if you like it or not, you must prepare for. Because there's too many occurrences among history in which somebody went to war, but they did not count the cost. They were not prepared for the demands of war. You saw General, General Custard who raged into against the Sioux and the Cheyenne with 210 men and how they were slaughtered very quickly. You also seen during World War II how the Nazis were coming into Poland and how the Polish soldiers came out and they rushed them on their horses with their swords. Needless to say, they were going against Hitler who had tanks and machine guns. And so as they came with all the bravery, with all the courage that they could muster, needless to say, they were wiped out swiftly and quickly because they were under prepared for the enemy the Bible talks about this idea of spiritual warfare and that we need to learn how to engage in the battle against Satan as we continue our series on become I want to focus on this idea of obedience let's look at our text here in 2nd Corinthians chapter 10 verse 3 to 6 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 to 6. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments in every lofty opinion, raged against the knowledge of God, and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. Now Paul is highlighting this adversarial relationship that he has with what he calls the super apostles. Literally in the original language it's supra apostolos which means super apostles and these individuals were attacking Paul and saying that Paul did not have the right motivations. That Paul was doing this work of evangelism because of selfish greed and selfish inclinations that he didn't care about the people he only cared about his own prominence and power and influence in his society that he was doing this just to merely advance himself and not to advance the gospel unlike them who held themselves up to be the intellectual elite at that time that they were the ones that were truly dedicated to God and that they knew best they had elitism reeking within their bones and bodies and so Paul instead of fighting against them and saying well I'm smarter than you no you're not yes I am he says, I will fight against you by my humility. He talks about being there and being beaten and how he was serving the Lord and the punishment that he went through. He didn't try to say, well, I'm a better speaker. Oh, I'm more gifted. I'm more talented. Therefore, you should listen to me. He says, I have given up everything I have and I count all my talent to be nothing compared to the riches of Christ's gospel, of Christ coming and saving me. And so as he battles against this worldly warfare, he gives us some help on how we can overcome the destructive nature of Satan. Look what it says here in our context in 2 Corinthians 10, 3-4. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. The idea of war is one is to engage battle, to serve as a soldier. He is saying that we aren't going to go against one another with a fleshly pride. We are fighting against demonic spiritual forces look what it says in Ephesians 6 12 for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against the rulers against the authorities against the cosmic powers over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places when we engage in spiritual warfare we need to know we're not fighting one another 
The battle is not against each other. It's not a human battle. But we are fighting against the forces of Satan. It is a spiritual warfare. Because you can't beat the world with worldly tactics. You can't overcome the world using the devices of the world to be successful. And so he says that you need to put off kind of this deception and deceiving one another. Because if you're going to try to overcome the world, the world will win if you use worldly warfare. This is why we do spiritual battle. Deception is one of these things that it only works for a while. Many of you will remember D-Day when the Allied forces fought against uh, the, uh, the Nazis and how they were there and they stormed Normandy in June 1944. But seven days after Normandy, they were still not certain if that was a victorious or not. We look back in history and say, yes, that was very definitive. But seven days after that time, they didn't know the ramifications of that battle. Was it going to be successful or was it a failure? And so they launched another initiative because they wanted the Germans to pull away from Normandy and then engage their forces at another location. And so there was a place called Cronin. In Cronin Peninsula, they wanted to mount a dummy assault. And so they started bringing these two Canadian ships. And maybe that's why it didn't work. They were Canadians. And so they put these two ships there. And the ships were going to start communicating with one another and leak information to give the indication that they were going to storm that area as well and that beach. But they looked back in history and one of the ships named the Huron did not make it. So they had to pull out and only one ship was there to try to create this idea of communication. To give an indication that there was actually going to be a force going into that peninsula. Needless to say, the Germans did Nothing. They tried to deceive the Germans to get them to pull away from Normandy and to engage in that area, but it was a failure. Anytime you use deception, it may work and it may fail because deception is a worldly tactic. But when you think about the difference between using God's warfare tools, truth, righteousness, you will never find a case in which truth was not the right thing to do. You will never find spiritual warfare and the tactics of spiritual warfare being counterintuitively destructive. You will never find that which God says you should do being the wrong choice in any occasion. But if you use deception, if you use worldly tactics... It may fail, but God's spiritual warfare tools never will fail. And so he gives us two ideas of how to defeat the forces of Satan. We got to control the mind. Look what it says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 21 to 22. You have heard that it was said of those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. Actions always start in the mind. And so if we're going to overcome Satan, here's the godly tools of warfare. The first thing that we must do is overcome Opinions. Overcome opinions. Look what it says here in 2 Corinthians 10.5. We destroy every argument and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Unfortunately, there's been some people in our society that believe they're too smart for the gospel. 
that they are smarter than God. And so sometimes people will conjure up these imaginary scenarios and they will conjure up these imaginary thoughts and say, well, look, I have found ways that God is not true. Or I found better thoughts and better methodologies that I find better ways for you to be successful. And so a lot of times they will make up stuff and then they will say, oh, here is the truth. It's just opinion. It's just matter of worldly philosophy. It's not going to really save your soul. Think about some of the truths of this world. Unborn babies are not human. Think about the truth of, it's better for me to get a divorce than so my kids won't see me fight. Think about... The ideas that we have in our world that intimacy has no spiritual connection. Over and over again, the world takes something that is untrue and tries to present it as a godly, right truth. And so if we're going to overcome the forces of Satan and win a spiritual battle, we got to make sure we discern if it is worldly wisdom or biblical truth. And the next way that we overcome the forces of Satan is we tame thoughts. Look what it says in 2 Corinthians 10, 5 to 6. And take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. There are thoughts that are destructive to your spiritual life. And in our society, we have held up this value of open-mindedness. Now think about this idea of open-mindedness and how we hold it up as some great value and we tell people, oh, you're so absolutely wonderful because you're open-minded. Is there really a lot of wisdom in being open-minded? That doesn't mean that we're closed-minded and that's what the world has tried to present it to us. You can be open-minded, Or closed-minded. And so if you're not open-minded, that means you're closed-minded and you haven't thought anything new for the last thousand years. Open-minded is a way for Satan to influence you in your thoughts. The reason being is not every thought is productive. Not every thought is a healthy, good thought. There's some thought it's best just not to have. There is some wisdom in the idea of saying, you know, I don't think this will be spiritually healthy for me to think about. I don't think this is very biblically good for me to think about. I don't think this is going to be wise for me to be open-minded in this area because ultimately it may lead to sin. If you guard your thoughts and discern your thoughts, you're not going to have to worry about as much if you're going to engage in that activity or not. If you can't think it, you're not going to act it out. And so all behavior begins in the mind. And so we need to be discerning I'm not saying being closed-minded. I'm not saying be somebody who never ponders a new thing. But I'm saying this. If a new thought or somebody presents something to you that you feel is unbiblical, you don't have to be the person that says, well, I just want to be open-minded. You're allowed to say, you know, according to God's word, that is not really correct. You know, that's probably not a healthy way to think about this because it could lead to this. Or maybe you say, I'm going to take control of my mind and I'm not going to allow it to reflect on things that will not be healthy in my home and in my spiritual life. This is what Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. 
Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by, now notice this, by the renewal of your mind. That by testing, you may discern what is the will of God. What is good and acceptable and perfect. Merely being pleased that we expose ourselves to everything doesn't make us godly. Sometimes it makes us undiscerning to what God would have us to do. There are boundaries in our minds. And we need to guard those boundaries in how we think about situations. So I was reading this book, and I really got into this stuff for a while. It was Tony Robbins. I think it's Tony Robbins. Anthony Robbins. And he wrote this book called Awaken the Giant Within. And always being a little short and small, I thought, that's something I could do. (laughs) And so I read this book years ago, but it gave me something that has been really a positive thought in my mind. When people ask me how I'm doing today, and you may be going to the bank, you may be going to the grocery store, and somebody will say, oh, how's your day going? And there's some people that will sit back and they will tell the truth. They may be having a terrible day. How's your day? It's going absolutely terrible. How are you doing today? I'm sad. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm so tired and wore out. How am I even going to be able to focus on my life? I have decided that no matter what, when someone asks me how my day is, it is great, it is fantastic, I'm doing wonderful. You know why? Because I control my attitude. I control my brain. The world doesn't control me. I control how I view this world. I control my attitude. And so when someone asks you, how are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm doing great. I'm doing fantastic. Because as soon as you say you're sad, you know what you will be? Sad. As soon as you say you're doing fantastic, you feel like you better be fantastic. And so when we take our thoughts and tame them, and we captivate them for Christ, We are saying that God, you, through the word of God, controls how I think. You control who I am. And I will submit to you being the definitive voice in my life. Not the world around me. Not what the world tells me to be. I, through your power and through your spirit, I will become what you would have me to be. And so I take All thoughts captive to do that. We control the mind in order to obey Christ. And that is the greatest obedience of all. When you say the mind will be submissive to God. That's true obedience to Christ. You have an opportunity to respond. And maybe this response is, maybe you've been dealing with doubts. Maybe you've been wondering what God is doing in your life. Maybe it's the time that you say, you know, I need some help as well. And God will give you the gift of the Holy Spirit. If you will believe, confess, repent, be baptized for the mission of your sins, rise up out of that water to newness of life. Because the more you control your mind for Christ, the more you'll become like Christ. And so that is the process of transformation. And if we could pray, if we can encourage you in any way, why don't you do so as we stand and sing the invitation song. Not a bird.